Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. On today's Visitor's Edition, my guest is the radio play-by-play voice of Penn State football, Steve Jones. First, let's get it rolling with my view from Section 17. If times were normal, we would be getting ready for the game on Thanksgiving weekend. As we know, nothing is normal right now. I'm very thankful we have college football to watch and take our minds off this mess for at least a few hours a week. This week, Penn State visits the very empty big house looking for their first win. Do I think they are a bad football team? From a talent perspective, the answer is no. As far as how they are playing, yes. They are not a good football team right now. They have dealt with an amazing number of injuries this year, and it has been too much to overcome. Like us, they are searching for answers on both sides of the ball, hoping to turn that corner. As far as we go, I like what I saw from Cade McNamara against Rutgers. He deserves the start on Saturday. I also thought when he was in the game, the offense just ran smoother. It made a big difference that he was able to complete passes early, which made that defense back off. That gave the young offensive line a chance to not be forced to block eight guys in the box, which opened up the running game. Let's see if we can continue doing that. The defense, it's going to struggle, though. Injuries, Youth and lack of depth have us reeling. The only thing Don Brown can do is coach these young guys up, and who knows, maybe we'll see some of them step up and make progress in the coming three weeks. That's where we are as a program right now. Finding young players on both sides of the ball who just want to give it their all, play for the team, and compete for a job next year. And believe it or not, there's a lot of auditioning going on out there. My guest today says he has no doubt both Michigan and Penn State will bounce back next year. Up next on our visitor's edition of the show is the longtime radio play-by-play voice of Penn State football, Steve Jones, here on The Michigan Man, so stay with us. Here with us on our visitor segment to uh, talk about the big game this Saturday, Thanksgiving weekend in the Big House, Penn State Radio play-by-play voice, Steve Jones. Once again, Steve, great to have you back with us. Mike, it's an absolute pleasure. Great to be with you. Well, Steve, Penn State comes into this Saturday's matchup 0-5, and that's for the first time in the program's 134-year history, and there are a lot of reasons. 
First and foremost, you have injuries and opt-outs. Just to name a few, Micah Parsons opts out before the season. Journey Brown's career ends with a medical retirement. Noah Kane goes down for the season. And now last week, tight end Pat Fryermuth needs surgery done for the year. Just unbelievable, isn't it? Oh, it's unbelievable, all right, <laughs> to watch it all play out. Because if you had to hand-pick five guys that couldn't, that Penn State couldn't lose, well, three of the five are gone. <laughs> Actually, yeah. four of the five are gone. Uh, between Parsons, Journey Brown, Noah Kane, and Pat Fryermuth, that's four of the five you felt like you absolutely couldn't lose and you lost them. Uh, so, you, look, you just have to carry on and push forward with what you have. I mean, this whole thing about next man up, I always feel is cold. You miss those guys. The other guys are stepping in, and guess what? It's their opportunity now. Sometimes you find out some things and realize that, okay, guy can play. And I'll give you a good example. Years ago, Penn State had an outstanding linebacker, Mike Maudie. Mm-hmm. Maudie ended up uh, getting hurt in a game against Temple. You're like, oh, my goodness, they've lost money. That's bad. And the kid named Nate Stupar stepped up. And Stupar ended up having a spectacular rest of the season, had a really great year the next year, ended up being drafted by the Giants, and is still in the NFL. Right? So, yeah. you know, it, you know, so you never know sometimes, and that's what you have to wait and see. Let's see who steps up and is able to play for some of these guys. And maybe they start carving out their own niche. But you're right, Mike. If I had to pick five guys that they couldn't lose, Four of the five guys have been lost. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's just been unbelievable to watch this all unfold. And, you know, I hearken back to the uh, Penn State opener with I- Indiana, a game in which Penn State was in control until the very end or late in the game. And for a team, that was a deflating loss, especially the way it ended, Steve. The Nittany Lions have not played well since, have they? No, they ha- they haven't, in fact. Uh, I mean, I thought I live he didn't make it. I watched the replay. I don't think he made it. I also know that me saying that is irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that's the way it is. Uh, but, yeah, it was deflating. And then they went, what, 12 consecutive quarters without without having the lead until they finally took the lead against Iowa in the first quarter on Saturday, 7-3. to three. So, yeah, it was deflating. It took a lot out of them. And, I mean, now they're at the point where it's it, – you feel like every week's the line in the sand, so they're back to line in the sand time going to Ann Arbor. Well, you know, watching Sean Clifford last year, I thought Penn State, hey, they're set at quarterback for a few years, but he has struggled, and I think it was Will Levis got to start last week. He struggled, so quarterback issues too. Yeah, that's something I didn't really count on. Uh, last year, Clifford had 23 touchdown passes and seven interceptions. That's a better than three-to-one touchdown to interception ratio. That's pretty good. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's good. And I thought maybe this could be the kind of guy that could go out this year, maybe get, you know, in a shortened season, like 25 touchdown passes, maybe five picks, something like that. But you know what? It's It's been turnovers. Penn State has, and that's, if you want to pick the number one problem, it's turnovers. Everything else in the pyramid dovetails from that. Field position, mistakes, things like that, all, you know, start with turnovers. And Sean has had problems with it. In fact, Defense, the defense against Penn State has scored a touchdown in each of the last three games. Mm-hmm. And you can't, we can't live that way. Iowa had 24 points off of turnovers. I had 24 points. Well, that's 24 of your 41 points. And you just can't. The only game where Penn State played clean, except for one really late year behind turnover, was Ohio State, believe it or not. All the other games... Three turnovers first half against Indiana. Indiana built a 17-7 lead. You know, then, of course, the Ohio State game. Then against Maryland, Maryland had not had a takeaway all season. Fumble, return for a touchdown. Penn State you know, outscores them 19-7 in the second half, but that, that plays a crusher. They turned it over two other times trying to come back. Nebraska, hey, right away, turnover, run back, field goal. Second quarter, fumble, run back for a touchdown. Now you're behind the eight ball again playing catch-up. And, of course, I just documented what happened with Iowa. That's been the the season right there, Mike. Yeah, no no doubt about it. Turnovers, as Coach Franklin said last Saturday after the game, have been the downfall of Penn State this year. A lot of other things going on, too. Uh, You know, I look at that backfield. Uh, Journey Brown and Noah Kane, of course, out. Devin Ford has been the starter. He goes down last week against Iowa. 
And how bad is his injury, by the way? Mike, I don't know that yet uh, because they just did a walkthrough on Sunday, and as we do this on Tuesday, this is the first time they're practicing this week. So I don't have a feel yet as to what Devin Ford's situation is going to be. But you got Keziah Holmes and Kevon Lee. Now, when they were recruited, everyone was like, wow, you recruited two of them? <laughs> really? You signed two? Boy, I'm really glad they signed two because right now they need both, Mike. Uh, oh, yeah. They're the ones that had to carry the load against Iowa. They're two excellent prospects. But, you know, you've gone from what you thought was a loaded running back room, which would be the envy of most programs. Hey, you got Jordy Brown, you got Noah Kane, you got Devin Ford, to now looking around the running back room and saying, okay, you guys had name tags on four months ago. <laughs> so we can know your name. <laughs> So that's where you are at this point. I mean, they're great prospects, but it does put them in a tough spot. Well, you know, that offensive line returned four starters this year for Penn State. Has the injury bug bit them too? No. You know, and that's the interesting part, Mike. I can't figure this part out, um, to be honest with you. I thought this could be the best offensive line Penn State's had since 2008. Wow. You know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at a veteran team. I'm looking yeah. at a fifth-year center, a fifth-year tackle. I'm looking at a returning starting left tackle, a returning starting right guard, and then the left guard played so much last year, he might as well have been a uh, pseudo-starter. You know, so I'm looking, and then they had depth. Now they've had one guy that's, that backs up that may have end up, ended up starting. He did get hurt, but, I mean, the guy that replaced him, I was perfectly fine with. But I... This part I can't figure out, Mike. I can't figure out why the offensive line, you know, did I sit there and think, that, you know, that this was going to be the Oakland Raiders with Art Shell and Gene Upshot? No. But I thought it was going to be a really good college offensive line. And right now they've struggled with some things. And it's, you know, it's made Clifford make decisions quicker than maybe he wants. The running game has been up and down. And I didn't count. That's something I did not count on. And I've watched this for decade and I did not count on that well if there has been a light in the darkness for the offense it has been the play of receiver Jahan Dotson he has been very impressive hasn't he he's been outstanding Mike uh, he really has Parker Washington the true freshman also has played really really well and you know you can't just go out there with one guy because you can bracket that guy but he had 144 yards and he was matched up with Sean Wade all night at that receiver spot and made some spectacular spectacular plays. He's coming off a 139-yard performance against Iowa. So he's had three 100-plus receiving games already this season. Made a lot of big catches. Made a lot of big plays. And he's been everything that they could have asked for. They're hoping for somebody to step up and be K.J. Hamler this year. Dotson, Dotson has done that. He has lived up to everything I thought he could be. And you know, when you look at this offense, Steve, at this point of the season, I know coaching staffs like to, uh, usually by game five or game six, you can point at, okay, the offensive line, we have to tweak that. Or we need to uh, work with the quarterback, with the running backs. But there's not one thing you can just point to with that offense, just like Michigan, and say, if we fix this, it will work. It's just so frustrating, isn't it? It is, except that my addendum to that would be, Mike, is that if you can get better offensive line play, I think the other stuff does start to fall into place for you, though. It's not... It's not as if Clifford's getting sacked left and right and so forth, but there is pressure on him, and he does have to make decisions quicker than he wants. And you do, and, and your play-action pass game isn't there because you're not able to run the ball I, uh, the way you want to run it. I think if they could get the offensive line part to start to fall into place, I think other items in a domino effect would fall into place. Well, a statistic I found mind-boggling about this Penn State team is that they've been outscored 117-33 <laughs> to 33 in the five first halves of games played this season, which means you're playing catch-up ball in the entire second half, and with all the injuries and the turnovers, that is a recipe for disaster, isn't it? It is, Mike, because I know uh, Jack Ham and I, Jack works with me on football, and then Dick Girardi works with me on basketball. We constantly talk all the time, all the time, Mike, about the psychology of playing with the lead. Mm -hmm. Playing with the lead is just so important because if you're playing from behind, you're playing uphill the entire time. You always feel like you're trying to catch up. 
And in a lot of these games, when you're talking about Penn State being down, in every game this season, at one point or another, they've been down two scores. So that means you're going, you're at points in games. The Penn State was going through points in games where they're out there trying to get a score back, but that score doesn't tie the game or put them in front. You're trying to get a score back. And that's really so hard to play that way. Now, part of it's what the opponent, what the opponent's done, and part of it's what you've done to create it. And so part of it's your fault for creating that. But, yeah, that, that's been the hard part, playing from behind all the time. Well, I know the turnovers are the biggest contributor to uh, a differential like that 117-33 to 33 score in the first half. But the defense has not helped out a lot either, have they, Steve? Well, they need to, they need to get takeaways themselves. I mean, yeah. You're minus nine not only because you turn it over, but you're minus nine because you only have four takeaways. Yeah. Uh, and that's you know, and when I talk about the opponent having 51 points off of takeaways, Penn State is 13 points off of takeaways this year. And they only have the four. I mean, you could change the entire dynamic of the game. You can change momentum. You can change field position. You can change the feeling on your sideline by getting some takeaways. Now, the corners have held up pretty well. Joey Porter Jr. and Tariq Castro Fields have held up pretty well. I think P.J. Mustford, defensive tackle, has played well. Uh, Shaka Tony is coming off a really good game, and Jason Owe has played really well. But the linebackers need to play better. The two safeties need to play better and, you know, along the way. And they've just got to, they've got to be the team that sets the tone and be aggressive. Penn State's a team that always is on the plus side of giveaway takeaway. That means they're ta- getting takeaways. Yeah. And Penn State last year had over 100 points off of takeaways. I mean, so, I mean, it's such a determining factor, and that's why the plus-minus thing is always the first thing I look at on any team. And right now, Penn State's uh, plus-minus number is a recipe for disaster. Well, I know Penn State fans are asking the same question Michigan fans are right now. How could this happen to a team with such great recruiting classes and what you thought was depth of talent? But for Penn State, the injuries to the impact players, it's been off the charts. We've been talking about that. And even though there, there is plenty of young talent waiting in the wings, this year, overcoming all of the injuries is just asking an awful lot of these young guys, isn't it? It is, um, you know, and I agree with all that. You know, but in this particular year, and I look at Michigan, I look at Penn State, I don't think anybody knows how anybody is really reacting to what's going on with the pandemic. Look at when the, when the Big Ten wasn't playing. Look at the teams that lost early on. Iowa State lost its opener to Louisiana. Iowa State then went and beat Oklahoma. Texas had a couple losses. I mean, there they were a lot of unpredictable losses early in the season by teams. Yeah. The difference, the difference between Michigan and Penn State, uh, the difference between Michigan, Penn State, and others in this situation is this. Michigan and Penn State could have used a non-conference schedule. They could have used a non-conference schedule to have more talent than somebody else, make mistakes, but have enough to win, which I think is a, is a great way to teach. Instead, Michigan and Penn State didn't have that. <clears throat> like everybody else in the Big Ten, they jumped into conference play, and suddenly their mistakes early in conference play became more magnified because you were playing better teams instead of working out the bugs in the non-conference schedule. And I think the way everything has been with COVID and how players had to work out and how locker rooms are split up, and just a long list of things going on. I mean, my goodness, even this trip. I mean, Penn State normally – Hey, 12, you know, they're done with their workout around 11.30 or noon. Then they get a little quick bite, whatever, have a meeting. Then they get in the plane, they go, they land. Then they have a little quick bite. Then they have meetings, and then they have their dinner, and then they have more meetings and the whole thing. They can't do that this time. When Governor Whitmer put in uh, the executive order on November 15th about gatherings, it meant Penn State had to change how they were doing the trip. So they're going to do the meetings and the eating here, fly in, sleep, that, and then do a grab-and-go box lunch or box breakfast in the morning and then go to the, go to the stadium. All these things, every team, I mean, it, it, every team has had to go through this, so it's Penn State's turn to go to Michigan. They've got to go through it. 
And it's just an adjustment that everybody has to make that just has set everybody out of their routine. And I, I'll tell you, a sense of normalcy, I think, is, I think is one of the better recipes that may bring a sense of normalcy back to Michigan and Penn State football. No, I agree with that. I think a lot of folks do. I was talking to a couple of Michigan's beat writers yesterday, and we all agreed when trying to preview uh, the game Saturday, we have no idea how this thing is going to play out. These are two teams that both need to turn the corner. Very difficult game to look at and say, this is what this team or the other team needs to do to win, isn't it? It is. Uh, but I give Michigan credit. They went into Piscataway. And that was a heck of a win the other night. Rutgers is a better team. There's no getting around. Greg's doing a great job with them. And then I came McNamara. I thought, looked good. He looked sharp. I, gave, I think he gave them a lift uh, and played well. But, yeah, I mean, both teams are right now in search of something. And if anybody – has a crystal ball that could predict this game. Talk to me when the game is over, because I then I have a bunch of other things I want you to predict along the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Steve, this year has been one we'd like to forget on many levels. I think we can all agree on that, including the football season uh, to some degree for Michigan and Penn State. As you mentioned, there have been difficulties to overcome. We know that. But they're going to learn from that this season, and I expect both of them to bounce back big next year, don't you? Yeah, I do, too. I, that's what, that was the point I was making about both programs. I think Michigan will absolutely bounce back. I think Penn State will absolutely bounce back. I think we'll look at this as the 2020 aberration yeah. when it comes to both programs along the way. But you know what? It's just like everybody just take a moment, look around. This is Thanksgiving weekend. We all have a lot to be extremely thankful for, and, and you don't have to look far to find it. So, it may not be if you're a football fan of Michigan, you're a football fan of Penn State. This has been a, a hard ride for you this year. But you know what? Look around. There's plenty to be thankful for. and Just enjoy it. Well, well said, and I agree. Final question for you, though, Steve. We do have a lot to be thankful for, but the natives are restless here in Ann Arbor. And the, <laughs> the, the one question I get every day is, how can you defend Jim Harbaugh? That has loaded up my email box in the last few weeks. And there's no doubt a lot of alumni and fan base that think it's uh, time for a coaching change. Are you hearing the same things about Coach Franklin right now? Uh, I get dots in stores all the time, and I get more of, hey, look, uh, we got to keep this guy. Uh, so I get more of that. Now, on the message boards, where anonymity is just yeah. a, a glorious way to express an opinion, uh, there, there are people that want people gone and fired and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that, that happens all the time. Uh, but no, you know what? When James Franklin took over at Penn State, Penn State was coming off and was still in the midst of sanctions. In fact, he, he coached uh, the pinstripe bowl with 41 scholarship players available because Penn State only had 63 scholarship players allowed. Yeah. And so he brought the program back from that. So he's already proven that he can take something that's baseline and bring it and make it into something to win 42 games in four years and win a Cotton Bowl and win a Fiesta Bowl. If a guy has the ability to do what he did before, that's the track record I want to do it again. And that's exactly, and he is the perfect guy to do it again because he's already proven to me once he can do it. Well, it is a big game for both teams for different reasons. It's Penn State, Michigan. That's all you need to say. So I'm looking forward to it. It's just been a crazy year in the Big Ten in college football. Let's see what happens when we tee it up on Saturday. And again, you are so right. We have a lot to be thankful for. Let's enjoy that we even have a college football game this Saturday. That's exactly right, Mike. Exactly right. You know, it's, it's at the point you're looking around it's like, okay, they're playing? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, our guest on our visitor segment this week has been the outstanding radio play-by-play voice of Penn State football, Steve Jones. Steve, always a pleasure having you on the show, and we thank you for uh, carving out so much time for us, and we wish you and your a very happy Thanksgiving, and we look forward to that next visit. Mike, you and yours and all your great fans out there, happy Thanksgiving out there in uh, Ann Arbor and Michigan and across the great state. And uh, one of the great things about this rivalry between the two is I get to talk to you every year. Amen, Steve, and uh, I appreciate talking to you too.
On Quick Hits today, no injury updates once again this week. On his radio show on Monday, Jim said several players were working through injuries, but he did not go into any detail, so we just have to wait and see who suits up again on Saturday. Here are a few game day facts. We lead the series with Penn State with 14 wins against 9 losses. The first meeting was on October 16, 1993 at State College, a 21-13 Michigan win. Penn State won last year's game 28-21 at their place, and it was played on October 19. Head coach James Franklin is 56-28 and 28 at Penn State, and in his seventh year there, he is 80-38 and 38 in 10 years as a head coach. Last year, they were 11-2 overall, 7-2 in Big Ten play. They returned eight starters on offense and five on defense. That was before all of the injuries and the opt-outs started to take their toll. They beat Memphis in the Cotton Bowl 53-39, ending the season ranked number nine in both polls. The weatherman is saying we will have a very nice late November day for football on Saturday. Sunny skies and temps in the low to mid-40s. Kickoff is at high noon, and the game is being broadcast by Fox Sports. That will do it for another show. Once again, I would like to wish each and every one of you a very happy Thanksgiving. I know it's going to be different, but hopefully at this time next year, we will be at least somewhat back to normal. So enjoy your day as best you can. Even with all of the restrictions and quarantines in place, we can still find something to be thankful for. I mean, the fact we have college football to look forward to is one of those things. Have a great Wolverine weekend, everyone. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Until the next time, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!